Psychotourism is probably the oldest work in the exhibition. It was made in 1996, not long after I left art school. And it's a photographic collaboration with an actress, Sophie Lee, who was actually at the height of a celebrity then. Looking back at this photo, it's interesting to see how clearly it foreshadows the issues that would come to dominate my work. It's also one of the first works where I left painting and drawing behind. And I just started with an idea and set out to find collaborators who could help me bring that idea to life. This work is about the idea of a designer baby. And Sophie is selling the baby. She's sort of your unique selling personality. But as we see in the work, she's fiercely protective of this child. She's almost saying, you come closer and I'll just throw myself off, off the edge. Um, kind of like Thelma and Louise. Like she's so committed to this child. Big Mother is a very personal work for me. And it's a direct response to two experiences. One is the story told to me, and the other is my own difficult experience breastfeeding my son Hector. That's why the mother is breastfeeding. The story I was told revolves around a baboon who, grieving the death of her baby, steals a human baby girl as a surrogate. The little girl survived, but I was interested in the baboon. Her story was so sad and so universal. I was struck by the way her grief blinded her to the difference between species, suggesting that this difference might not be as fundamental as we think. The Welcome Guest reflects on the beauty and strangeness of nature. The creatures I invent seem strange, but think about the peacock. Who would have thought that beauty would be so important that evolution would arrive at a creature as crazy and ridiculous as the peacock. With this creature, nature chooses beauty over efficiency or strength. It's, it's so at odds with the way we would engineer creatures, which puts usefulness above everything else. Do we think it's okay to create new life just to be wonderful? I don't think so. But then again, the peacock tells us that it's a good enough reason for nature. The Young Family was the first work I made that really made an impact on the world stage. I showed it at Venice in 2003. And looking back, it still encapsulates so many of the key issues of my practice. Difference, empathy, maternity, technology. It's a work inspired by science the use of other animals to generate human replacement organs, xenotransplantation. But it's a work that's animated by emotion, the love of a mother for her children, and we can really see it in the work. However, I don't think it's possible to really overlook the dark dilemma that gives this work its spine. What if you had to choose to end the life of her child to save the life of your own. Many of my works present a technologized form of nature. The stags is part of a body of work that show the opposite side of this coin, the converse, naturalized technology. In our world, many plants and animals have been reduced to parts in a massive industrial machine. In this world where we might see cows as a milk machine, the stags are a kind of snapshot from an ecology of mechanical wildlife that we will never see. In depicting the scooters as wild animals rather than domesticated ones, deers rather than sheep, the work also suggests a world of technology that is beyond our mastery, our control. And this is both wonderful and unsettling. The bottom feeder looks at the idea of duality. It's an imagined creature that is literally two-faced. Its true face is shark-like, and it references the vital role that sharks play in keeping the seabed clean. They're scavengers. They clean it all away. 
However, its wrinkled backside actually takes on the appearance of a Buddha-like face. And this is a common trick in nature that insects and reptiles often do. It's a deception aimed at misdirecting potential predators. Here, go for my tail instead of my face. And in this case, the predator are humans. The face is designed to appeal to people, to endear the animal to us, or at least amuse us. And this is a reminder that we are, in fact, the apex predator of pretty much every ecosystem on the planet. Sharks have a lot more to fear from us than we do from them. The carrier discusses what we want from the creatures that we might create. What we see is a bear-like creature with a really big gut because bears hibernate and when they do, they put on over 100 kilos and he's carrying an older woman. It also wonders at the unexpected emotional connections that might arise. We look at them and we see that they're both looking in the same direction. And what this normally means is that they, they're together, they're seeing the world in the same way, so they have an emotional connection alongside a physical connection. He's carrying her. In this work we see the paradox of the magnificent and powerful creature who appears to be a servant to the physically weakened human. There's no obvious animosity, but we can't help but wonder about the possible inequity of the situation. It's impossible to tell whether this is a pair of caring equals or something much darker. I love the way that an exhibition changes the space it occupies. The gallery itself can be transformed by the work it contains. This transformation is often metaphorical, but in this work I wanted to play with the literal transformation of the gallery to introduce this massive form that completely disrupts the sight lines of the space, but at the same time inserts a completely new place into it. The thing about this object is that it's literally impossible to see it within the gallery space. There's no point where you can step back far enough to see the object itself. In fact, it can only be seen from the inside. I was inspired by my experience with the Sky Whale, a hot air balloon sculpture that I produced a few years ago. During the process of inflation, I was able to enter the balloon itself and being inside it was amazing. It was this totally other space, like I had stepped outside of the world. I wanted to give everyone the opportunity to experience this and to create something inside the gallery that takes you outside of it. The core concerns of curious affection include relationships, ambiguity, wonder and fertility and they all come together in the pollinator. This work depicts a curious creature exploring the pouch of an imposing plant-like organism that seems to defy categorization. Certainly it is corporeal, it has a body, but it lacks complex articulation of a regular animal. It has no head and it seems structured more like a tree. Yet it has a pouch, which seems to nurture something. An egg, a seed, a baby, it's hard to tell. But in that very ambiguity we see a commonality. Through all of the extraordinary range of differences that traverse the space between plants and animals, this process, the seed, the egg, the baby, fertilization, this process is ubiquitous. We tend to think of this process as a very private and intimate thing, but often we actually find the involvement of some kind of intermediary, a pollinator. This is someone else, an outsider, who gets involved in this process, whether it's a bird or insect or animal, 
It helps to facilitate this intimate connection. This is one of the most basic and primal interspecies relationships and proof that the world cannot be lived in alone. The idea that we as humans are uniquely and fundamentally different from other animals is a cornerstone of how humans have traditionally seen ourselves. It is this specialness that allows us to exploit the environment and other beings around us so completely. However, both genetic analysis and observation is now showing how small that difference really is. We see common DNA everywhere and common behaviours in many other animals, especially primates. Like us, orangutan mothers keep their children close and educate them over many years. If I want my children to eat vegetables, I just tell them I'm their orangutan mother. In this work, we see three unique individuals, each set at a different point on a continuum of greater or less animalness. However, the point is not their difference. It is their connection. In the bond, we see a relationship between a mother and a transgenic child. It's both deep and ambiguous. The child has a strange physiognomy. Its back is essentially the sole of a running shoe. On one level, this refers to the common evolutionary trait where animals such as stick insects, for example, they disguise themselves as part of their environment which highlights both the strange and super-specific cleverness of evolution alongside the deeply specific connections between species and their particular environments. In this case, the animal's mimicry of a piece of consumer sportswear locates it totally as a product of our world. Secondly, it evokes the idea of the protean amorphousness of the body as it is understood in the age of biotechnology. Bodies are never final or particularly specific. The universality of DNA means that organisms can be changed and manipulated, crossed and hybridized with elements from completely outside of their realms. This crossing of an animal with a shoe doesn't seem so surreal anymore, but it is. I'm very interested in looking at ways of representing fertility in the most expanded sense. Life, abundance, diversity, fecundity, reproduction, parenthood. All these ideas animate the world that I'm trying to make, just as they animate the world around us. I'm especially interested in looking for ways to represent this that don't fall into the traditional cliches and associations that belittle the mother or reduce sensuality to obscenity. In much of my work, I'm looking for different ways to celebrate life and a different kind of beauty. This is one of those works. It is an unashamedly strange juxtaposition of elements Motorcycle boots wearing leather leg roots that support a tree-like torso covered in budding elbows that grow into a bough laden with helmet fruits on top of which sits a magnificent wedge-tailed eagle. Everything in this work is pushed as far as I can take it. It is surreal and sensual. The torso reflects the depiction of Saint Sebastian in ecstasy. And the helmets and legs come from my own love of the aesthetics of automotive painting, form and upholstery. The eagle suggests both power and freedom, but also gestures to the web of life, the interdependency of different species and complexity of ecosystems. It is a compositional balancing act with a wide range of elements and materials. On another level, it is entirely symbolic. It depicts 
unconstrained growth, fruitfulness and sensuality, corporeality that is about life itself rather than any particular kind of life. On yet another level, it is the heart of the show. It reflects the whole range of the ideas, materials and imagery that animates the entire exhibition. One of the most wonderful things about living where I do in Melbourne is stepping out of my house at dusk to find the sky black with flying foxes, engaged in their nightly expeditions in search of food. These amazing animals, technically speaking they're known as megabats, seem at odds with the inner city, but as their natural habitats are lost to human impact, they're drawn to the parks and gardens. Like many of the creatures referenced in this show, bats are pollinators, vital links in the chain of fertility that links animals and plants. Aesthetically and symbolically, bats are amazing to me, and I'm always struck by their camps, which is what they're called in the daytime. I wanted to make a work that referenced them and their dark, glossy angles, bones and skin. This work also nods to another of my interests, fungi. I could talk for hours about fungi, but it's worth mentioning that fungi too occupy this largely unheralded but vital position in the web of life. Nestled within the grotto are a series of three small figures, which I call the eagle eggmen. These strange little guys are something of a reference to Charles Lebrun the 17th century French architect and artist who towards the end of his life produced a series of etchings blending human and animal forms. I've always loved these images, which are almost but not quite convincing, and they were the jumping off point for these figures. The eagle egg men have similarly blended but essentially human faces but beneath their aquiline faces, their bodies begin to morph and distort, defying the rules of physiognomy without actually throwing them away. Each figure cradles a little pouch full of eggs, suggesting that they have some sort of role to play in husbanding the eggs. They are the masculine presence in the reproductive world. I imagine that perhaps these are the only two creatures of their kind, and somehow they found each other and escaped. Their location within a caravan is very deliberate. A caravan is a space that is almost a house, but temporary, not rooted in one spot. It's domestic but also mobile, compact and cocoon-like. The caravan carries the connotation of disconnection from the mainstream life either nomadic or socially excluded. And so the couple have the privacy that their intimacy requires, but also a sense of being outsiders, perhaps even on the run. In a way, this work could be seen as an anti-Frankenstein story. In Shelley's book, the monster's sense of isolation and rejection leads him to beg his creator for a partner someone he can connect with. Victor Frankenstein's refusal to do this sets off the storm of rage and despair that ultimately leads to the tragedy of the novel. In the couple, we see a more sanguine outcome, although it's not without a sense of melancholy. These two figures have a sense of self-contained separation from the rest of the world. Ironically, in that way, they are perhaps like every other teenager in the world. They feel alone, unprecedented and unique in their experience of life. However, they may feel alone, but they are young and a couple. And in that sense, they represent the potential of life and energy of youth. They carry the possibility of reproduction and the possibility of a future outside of our control. 
even if their origin is within human control, their destiny is in their own hands.